We praise the Lord today, friends, visitors and guests, that you have come. You know, it is really a special day whenever Sabbath or the seventh day of the week comes along. It is a time to reflect, a time to be reconciled with our God, a time to praise Him and honor Him for the forgiveness that He has showered to all of us. I know that He, for all of you, for most of us, has been very hectic, and uh, yet the Lord has been so good that He has uh, sustained our lives up to this moment. This is a special Sabbath for all Millerites. Not the Millerites that happened 1844, which we all know about, but the Millerites from Cebu City. They always have the reunion every year. I think this is the ninth year, if I'm not mistaken, or oh, the seventh year. And all of the seven, seven years, they were all done here in Waterman Church. That's why I was telling Sister May at Lawan Oliva. Why can't you just share it to other churches where there are millerites too? Well, she did not really give me a good reason, but she said, well, we will do it again next year there in Waterman. <laughs> anyway, thank you for patronizing Waterman Visayan Phil Amisdi Church millerites. Thank you for coming all the way from Florida, Engineer Habaradas. From Canada, yes, I always see him, the couple, every Miller uh, meeting here. It's always a reunion, right, brother boy? And maybe from the Philippines. Well, of course, everybody comes from the Philippines. Almost all of us come from the Philippines. Nobody from Europe here. Oh, here, yes. From Germany. You see how magnetizing is uh, the Millerite cause from Germany. Best regards to Angela Merkel over there. And then, of course, uh, mostly here in California, Southern. What's that? From Cebu. Oh, from Cebu. Yes, the Philippines. I thought uh, it's not from the Philippines. OK. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. And I'm sure it's really a homecoming. It's a reunion. Every year you're doing it. And uh, I'm sure it has really strengthened your relationship, our relationship. It has edified all of us. You know, reunion sometimes is a time to remember. It is a time to laugh, a time to celebrate, a time to share. <laughs> share old stories and make new memories. That's a reunion, that's a homecoming. You know, it's a time to see each other in the faces that are all around us and find reflection of ourselves in the hearts of both young and old who are here today. And on behalf of my members here in Waterman Church, together with the pastoral staff and officers, we would like to, we are certainly delighted that you are here today. I hope we will be able to serve you the kind of convenience and a worshipful atmosphere as we celebrate God's holy day today. You know, reunion is not just a coming together that strengthens the bond of family, but it reminds us always of the gift of belonging. When we are reunited, there is that the gift of uh, belonging because we have a chance to share our history way back. Well, that was formerly Harry W. Miller Memorial Medical Center in Tres de Abril, Cebu. That's too long, right? So they changed it to Adventist Medical Center, Cebu. That's easier, and you can easily remember. Reunion is a chance to celebrate, a reason to celebrate our past, and a time to welcome our future. And here, listen to this. You know, reunion is like every parting gives a foretaste of death, but every reunion is a hint of the resurrection. It is. I don't know how many just lay, was laid to rest during the last seven years or the last six years of your uh, group. 
But whenever there is that parting, there is that hint of death. But let us not stop there because for every reunion, there is always a hint of what's going to happen, and that is resurrection. Well, I was telling Sister May I did not work in Miller Hospital before. Neither did I do my PGI. I know some of my friends here were former PGIs or postgraduate interns in, in Miller Hospital. Uh, I, I, I didn't have really that connection. So I was telling Sister May, why don't you just get somebody from the one in Miller? Well, I don't know. But anyway, you just ask her later. Now, sojournings and homecomings. There was an American novelist. His name is Thomas Wolfe. He wrote a novel that was entitled, You Cannot Go Home Again. You Can't Go Home Again. That was written by Thomas Wolfe, a novelist, an American novelist. And that was the title, You Can't Go Home Again. But the, the stories of the human race, as far as you know, as far as I know, is or are nonetheless replete with homecoming stories with reunions of people who did go home again. And in many cases, they recognized that once they are home again, home was really about to them for the very first time. But in contrast to Thomas Wolfe's novel or book, or Thomas Wolfe's observation, there was a guy who was a New York playwright his name was Rod Serling. He wrote this particular quotation that I'd like to share to, do, to you today. Everybody has to have a hometown. In the strangely brittle, terribly sensitive makeup of a human being, there is a need for a place to hang a hat or a kind of geographical womb to crawl back into. Or maybe just a place that's where you grew up. When I dig back through my memory cells, I get one particularly distinctive feeling that's one of warmth, comfort, and well-being. For whatever else, I may have had or lost or will find, I've still got a hometown. This nobody is going to take away from me. You notice that quotation? We always have a place. Wherever we go, wherever we are, we still have a hometown. Regardless of where we're from or where our respective hometown might be located today, we all can relate to the idea of a geographical womb. Geographical womb to crawl back into from time to time in order to experience the emotions of coming home and being part of what we know as family reunions, as reunions like co-workers of Miller Hospital, or high school class reunions, or just being get together, or simply homecoming day. Now even San Bernardino is not your hometown. And even if Waterman Church is not your home church, or even if you are in your home today, or if your home is in shambles, and even if your family is being challenged by what seems to be you know, insurmountable odds, we invite you this morning to just hang your hat and to crawl back into the geographical womb and be at home with us here in Waterman. We have no hidden agenda here today. You will have all your activities the whole day until tomorrow, I understand. So feel at home. Now today we have no desire to place additional obligations on your shoulders, of course. You are our guest. Be our guest. We simply extend to you an opportunity to just reconnect with God, 
reconnect with him and reconnect with his people. You were former workers of God's vineyard in that medical ministry right there in Cebu City. So let's try to just reconnect again. Reconnect with him and look around you today. Recognize the familiar faces of those who have journeyed alongside with you for many years. And remember those experiences, those stories in times past that made you smile and smile again and smile again. Now appreciate these many faces that you have today. Appreciate it. But both new and familiar ones that are among us. Make a new friend or renew an old acquaintance. But most important of all, friends and brothers and sisters, re redirect your thoughts toward God. Redirect your thoughts toward a God who has been faithful to bring you to another homecoming season right here in this place. So whether you're coming or going or are already here, we have the simple message, welcome home. Welcome home. It's time to celebrate homecoming. You know, in the New Testament, if you have your Bibles with you, go to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews. It appears that the writer of Hebrews, his audience was enduring some kind of persecution. His audience was enduring some kind of persecution and they were considering going back to the old Judaism rather than stay with the Christian faith. They were discouraged. They were depressed. They were disappointed. Life had trampled them to the point of rejecting their faith in Jesus. You know, we often speak of someone in an athletic contest who gets trampled by by his or her opponent. I can just remember that time back in the Philippines when we were watching this Prisa. Prisa, this is the private uh, school athletic association. They have these uh, different games and sports. I can remember trying, you know, somebody trying to do the track and field. He did the running, the long jump, and then ran to the 440 yard dash in high school. Now, while he did it okay in the running long jump, what happened, he was trampled in the 440-yard dash. And do you know what it's like to be running your very best race and have four or five guys 20 or 30 yards in front of you at the finish line? Man, it's discouraging when I saw that. He was trampled, that athlete. He made all of the other runners great, but he left the track very horrible. He was feeling horrible. Now the question is, have you ever been trampled in life? Have you ever been trampled in your former workplace or have you ever been trampled by your boss? Have you ever been trampled by somebody who thought was your friend? You know, I run into trampled people all the time, if not most of the time. And so did the writer of the book of Hebrews. To encourage a group of trampled Christians, the Hebrew 11, chapter 11 writer presents to us a kind of spiritual homecoming. He gathers, you know, together the names of those who have faithfully passed the test of faith, the legacy of faith, on to the next generation. That's how the author of Hebrews emphasizes. He reflects on the lives, on the lives of these heroes and heroines of the faith. You remember them? He was talking about Abel. He's talking about Enoch. He's talking about Noah. He's talking about Abraham in Hebrews chapter 12. He's talking about Sarah. And right there you see Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses. And then you have Rahab, 
Gideon, Barack, well, of course, not the President of the United States. Don't you know that there, the name Barack is also in the Bible? You may not have been reading the Bible. Barak is in the Bible, but he is in chapter 11 of Hebrews. Then you have Samson, Gideon, you have Jephthah, you have uh, David, and you have Samuel. Time and space, you know, restraints did not permit the writer of Hebrews to write all the different ones who kept the faith alive in their generation, even though it meant a great personal sacrifice to each of them. Now in the middle, you notice chapter 11, in the middle of this long list of heroes and heroines, there is a momentary pause. There is a momentary pause in the person by person account of the faithful in order to tease out certain implications from the lives of these whom he has mentioned. You notice that? The writer mentions five, five rich spiritual qualities or implications manifested in the lives of these Old Testament personalities. And we will be looking at that in a few minutes. Turn your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. These are the verses that we read earlier. It says right there, these all died in faith without receiving the things promised, but they saw them in the distance and welcomed them and acknowledged that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth. Then to the next verse, for those who speak in such a way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. And then the next verse, verse 15, in fact, if they had been thinking of the land that they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Then verse 16, but as it is, they aspire to a better land that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. What is the first implication? of that particular uh, post in the book of chapter 11 in Hebrews. The first is their confidence. What is their confidence? These all died in faith. You mean the heroes, the heroines that were mentioned earlier and the rest that were not written. They all died in faith without receiving the things that was promised. But they saw them in the distance and welcomed them. You know, all of these heroes, my friends, died with an unfulfilled dream. They all died. Their dreams unfulfilled. But they were confident that God would keep his word because they died not in rebellion, but in the faith. But in the faith. God's promise for a better place to live were deeply engraved in their hearts. The dream of a place where sin, separation, and death could not plague them anymore. But they did not have the joy of seeing this fulfilled in their lifetimes. Nevertheless, we are told down to their dying breath, they died with complete confidence that God would keep the promise to them. That was the number one, or that is the number one implication. A person of faith has this quiet confidence that God will take care of them. Even though dreams are shattered and plans lay collapsed at their feet and they feel trampled by life, they may not see the fulfillment of all of their dreams in their lifetime, yes, but nevertheless, they persist in the faith and die in the faith with a kind of quiet confidence. What is the second implication? Their witness. Hebrews 11:13. That's the second part. Acknowledged, in other words, they confessed that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth. You know, these heroes and heroines formulated a kind of community in conflict with the cultures around them. You know how the story of Abraham, you know how the story of Daniel David, they were formulating a kind of a traveling community that was in conflict with the cultures around them then. 
Their values, their priorities were not the values and priorities of the other nations among whom they live. They were different. This world was not their home. They belonged to another world. And they lived their lives in obedience to that which was to come. They refused to get themselves permanently entangled with the temporal. And they never allowed, they never allowed themselves to get too comfortable with life. The phrase strangers and aliens, meaning pilgrims, is well attested in the Bible. In the Old Testament narratives about the patriarchs and their descendants, what happened? They are aliens. They were aliens and strangers in the land. You read in Second Chronicles, you read it in Genesis, in the book of Psalms, that even Peter, the apostle Peter, wrote in First Peter 2, verse 11, Dear friends, I urge you, according to Peter, as aliens and strangers in the world, to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. My friends, people of faith have a clear witness. While they enjoy the blessings that is found in God's world, right here in this world, they also make a statement about the control that these things have over their lives. People of faith have a different set of priorities. We have a different set of priorities, my friends, and we have to speak a different kind of language with an eye, always on the eternal. Yes, we are in this world, but we are not of this world. That was the prayer of Jesus. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. People of faith have clear witness. What is the third implication? Their quest. 11 verse 14 says, For those who speak in such a way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. That was their quest. And I hope that will also be your quest. We are seeking a homeland. Not the United States of America or the United States of America. No. They said that before you go to heaven, you've got to go to America. For those who speak in such a way, make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. You know, these exiles, these strangers, these aliens were seeking a home. They were seeking a home. Their hearts were set on heaven. Their citizenship was there. Their citizenship was there. This was what motivated them. From Genesis to Revelation, from Genesis in the whole of scriptures, never allow us to lose sight of the idea of traveling or the journey quest motive. The Bible is one gigantic history book. It is one gigantic history book about travel story with God's interventions along the way. You know, it begins in the Old Testament, if you remember, or if you have been going along religiously, your Bible readings. It begins in the Old Testament with the individual patriarchs. Remember Abraham. Remember Isaac, remember Jacob, remember Joseph, journeying from one place to the next, seeking a permanent dwelling. Then it progresses to the nation of Israel. They journeyed into Egypt, thanks to Joseph. And after that, they journeyed back out again, thanks to Moses, and then journeyed through the wilderness for many years. They were a kind of traveling community in conflict with the cultures around them. They eventually had to journey into captivity despite prophetic calls to repentance. And some of their offspring even journeyed back home again with Nehemiah being their leader. And then we get to the New Testament. As this, as the, this journey motive still drives the text, Jesus journeyed. Don't you know that? Jesus journeyed from heaven to earth. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus journeyed from heaven to earth. You know, John says in the gospel that once he got here, he tabernacled. He tented among us. You know, his parents were even in a journey when he was born. 
they had journeyed to Egypt to protect him. After which, they journeyed back to Nazareth. From here and from there, Jesus journeyed from place to place, preaching the gospel, telling stories about prodigal stories, about prodigal sons and prodigal daughters who wander away and journey back home again. He was telling that. Finally, Jesus journeyed to Jerusalem, where he accomplished salvation for all of us. And then he journeyed back to heaven again. From there, he called Paul. You know Paul, the great apostle? One of his chief spokesmen who took three missionary journeys to spread the good news. People of faith realize, people of faith realize that they are on a journey, that we are on a journey, that this world is simply one little phase of this journey that extends into the eternal realms. This world is not your home. This world is not our home, brothers and sisters. It's a place of temporary residence. Enjoy your homecomings. Enjoy your reunions today. But don't get too comfortable here. Why? You're on a quest. And you're not home yet. We're not home yet. We wonder why life deals with such harsh blows to us. We are being hit on every corner with the powers of the principalities of darkness, well, remember, because we are not home yet. What is the fourth implication? Their discernment. Their discernment. 11.15 of Hebrews. In fact, if they had been thinking of the land that they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return. But, verse 16, but as it is the aspire to a better land. That is what? A heavenly one. They did not just merely anticipate heaven, my friends. No, they did not just anticipate heaven. They evaluated the things of earth and looking at the things that were seen, they quickly discerned that all the marks of stanchions, all the marks of impermanence and perishability were upon them in this world. To give their lives to these things was to misplace their time and to misplace their ability. The patriarchs never look back. They never look back. People of faith have this ability to distinguish between the temporal and the eternal. And the last implication is their security. Hebrews 11.16 says, Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Isn't that wonderful? God is not ashamed to just paraphrase this for all of us. Why? To be called their God. Why? Because he has prepared a city for all of us. Strangers and illegal aliens. That's sometimes the topic in the political Feel today, illegal aliens, strangers. Strangers and illegal aliens have often experienced hardship. They often experience social ostracism. They even experience economic deprivation. But God made them a promise. God made us a promise, my friends. No matter how bad things got, he would always be proud of them and gladly provide for them and give to them a city with all the amenities and conveniences of this implies, that this implies. People of faith stand to inherit God's blessings and provision. This is their security. So the vision and heroism of these great heroes and heroines of the faith challenges us. They confront us. They rebuke us, but also they inspire us. They inspire us. The Hebrew writer was persuading the readers, us, not to turn back. No turning back, my friends. Go forward, as he was telling Moses. You have all the soldiers of Pharaoh, mountains over here, another mountain range over there. Before you is Red Sea. God said, go forward, no turning back. For all of us pilgrims and all of us aliens here in this world, 
the vision and the heroism of these great heroes and heroines of the faith challenges us. They confront us, they rebuke us, they inspire us. The Hebrew writer was, you know, persuading his readers not, don't turn back. And his so doing encourages us to press on, press on. How do these heroes, heroines impact us? How? I'll tell you. First, you have those five, you have those, um, five uh, implications in case you just want to have a review. Confidence, witness, quest, discernment, and security. But how do these heroes of faith and heroines of faith impact us? They challenge the things or people in which we place our confidence. I'm reminded of godly Job. You know his story. He didn't know what was going on in his life. And I'm sure you do in your experience as a, a sojourner or as an alien in this world. You sometimes don't know what's going on in your life. Job didn't know what was going on in his life, why he was suffering to the extent that he was. But he makes this incredible statement of confidence in God and his goodness. Do you know what did you say? He says, though he slay me, I will hope in him. Though he slay me, I will hope in him. Job 13, verse 15. God, I may go to my grave without ever knowing what is going on in my life, but I want you to know something. You're my hope. And if I die, I'll die believing in and obeying you. This is my commitment, and this is my confidence for you today. Second, they confront our cowardice. I hope in our travel, in this faithly journey, not one of us here are cowards. Because this particular book challenges us and confronts our cowardice. They made bold confession to their faith in God. They were alienated and ostracized for their viewpoints and values. Many of them were trampled by life and yet they remained, what? Faithful. Third, they rebuke our materialism. This particular book of Hebrews chapter 11 rebuke our materialism. The majority of people lives as if this world is the only world. Living in this world means money and power. And the thing that this is the only and last world that we are going to inhabit. The faith heroes challenges us that assumption and the lifestyle that stems from that kind of thinking. If this world is all there is, I must grab as much life as I can while I can. But if there's another world to come, what's the hurry? What's the hurry? The faith heroes call us to a far simpler lifestyle and remain as that self Contented affluence is never to become a replacement of outgoing compassion. Fourth, they inspire our confidence. These heroes inspire, I mean, our obedience, sorry. My prayer is that God will help us to live our life for the things that really matter, my friends. Things that really matter. To extend the legacy of faith to our own children and children's children. And to live in light. In the light of the world to come. I want us to think of the day when all of us will be wrapped in the arms of Jesus. You know, dare to imagine that moment. Imagine that moment. You finally see the Savior you have ever served you have ever trusted and you have ever longed for. There he is, the Savior, who gave his life for your redemption, my redemption, and who brought you to faith and turned you from death to life. You know, this reunion is witnessed by the angels who wept at the fall of Adam and rejoiced when Jesus, after his resurrection, ascended to heaven. Having opened the grave for all who should live, believe in his name, now they behold the work of redemption accomplished and they unite their voices in the song of praise. That's found in the great controversy 
page 648. I don't know what that day will be, my friends. Do you know that day? I just don't know. But there is a reunion. It will be a homecoming. Now it will be something. I don't know what that day. We, we, will we fall immediately on our faces in grateful adoration or we will run instantly into his arms? Either way, I know the Lord will draw us to himself and wrap his arms around us and say, Welcome home, son. Welcome home, daughter. Look at this. Before the ransom throne is the holy city. Jesus opens wide the pearly gates and the nations that have kept that have kept the truth enter in where they beheld or behold the paradise of God the home of Adam in his innocence then that voice richer than any music that ever fell on mortal ear is heard saying your conflict is ended come ye blessed of my father Inherit the kingdom open, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's found in darkness before dawn, page 51. At that moment in time, all of the tramplings, all of the tramplings of life enduring while on earth, during our earthly sojourn, will forever be dissolved. No more. Nada. Zip. No more tramplings. This is the last verse of the great controversy. The great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. One, the entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illit illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy. Declare that God is love. Are you going to that city? It will be a great reunion. It will be such a wonderful homecoming. I hope we will see each other over there by the river of life. May the Lord bless us.